Hello everyone, thanks for coming today. Uh, we're happy to have the artist talk with Lisa Sylvester and Andrea Krupp in conjunction with their exhibition, which is a beautiful hair, we think. So we're excited to hear what they have to say about their work. So let's give Andrea and Lisa a warm welcome. <laughs> On having a conversation with with you and but but I, I and and with Lisa too, who I just met at the opening. So we're so thrilled to be showing our work together. First of all, I think yeah, that was yeah. really really brilliant in the room, and yeah. I think the the two works really um, they vibrate, they resonate, and they there's this reverberation. I really <laughs> feel that in the room. So um, as far as my work goes, okay, I'm going to go over here too. Maybe, yeah, I'm trying not to Sorry. cycle around too much. So the work that I'm showing here is is um, kind of following a train of thought uh, that started in the Arctic Circle and then it kind of looped through Ireland and it ended uh, with me in my studio back in Philadelphia. And that was maybe an arc of a year and a half uh, where uh, sort of pushing my work forward and developing my thoughts about how I feel about um, place, let's just call it place. I mean, we're, we're always in a place. We always feel things when we're in a place. And if we're lucky enough, we can go to really amazing and quiet and peaceful and beautiful places that really um, make it easy to, to go deep into self-reflection and reflection about the moment where we're in. I mean, we can do this in the city in Philadelphia, but the whole process is a little speeded up, I think, when you're, when you have a chance to sort of retreat and, and dive into self. So for me, my, the, the main themes in my work are self and, and place, and, and my work always is sort of a reflection of what's going on inside of me as I'm witness to what's happening in the world around me. Um, so, um, yeah, that's that's all I want to say right now. Let's let okay. Lisa give an overview, and and then maybe we can find ways to talk about that reverberation. Sure, sure. Um, well, I I guess um, a couple of things. My I guess I've been I've become more and more interested in um, I guess pattern and um, sort of slow building of a larger pattern from small sort of repeated units um, of both shape and then um, text that actually ends up forming shape, I guess, um, over time. And um, it's kind of, I don't know, the, t the text has been sort of filtering around in my work for quite a while, probably like 10, 10 years, maybe more. Mm -hmm. um, no, probably more. <laughs> Ten, more than that, yeah, yeah, more than that. And I, it, maybe it's been around you know, like more like 20 years or something. Mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but I feel that it's, um, I guess it's started to form maybe, it, it, it's, it's shrunk <laughs> recently um, <laughs> into a sort of micro, um, you know, scale or whatever, and um, I guess I'm particularly interested in how the text and the, the the linear elements that it sort of weaves, how those um, inter interplay with um, the other layers of, of shapes um, that kind of, to me, function, I guess, in a very general sense, like, s symbolically. Um, I, it seems like uh, as I think about it, you know, numbers, I'm, I'm not particularly into, you know, numerology or anything like that, I guess, but the, the numbers, um, you know, of, of how many um, repeated units, right, and, and that are going to go within a particular composition end up being kind of important, um, at least to me, right, in my relationship with it. Um, and then... Uh, I guess the shapes then to me have 
sort of a linkage to some of the ideas and um, you know themes that are actually embedded in the text. Um, and so the text is actually sourced from pretty specific places. Um, a lot of it ends up being from, well, it's a lot of it's from literature or po poetry that has sort of resonated with me sort of for a long period of time, long stretch of time, and remained um, interesting or provocative or um, relevant to ideas that I, you know, I think a lot about in my own life, um, you know, just based on experience or based on things that, you know, certain values that I have, um, you know, that have become, I guess, important in, in my own experience. And so the text kind of comes from passages that um, sort of speak to me on, um, in, in that regard. Um, a lot is actually ends up being from French writers, but I, I don't speak French. <laughs> um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not exactly sure sort of where that link is. Um, and there's, I guess this work is, since it's very slow um, in the making, you know, everything is just very, um, everything is just very methodically, slowly hand crafted, um, and you know that precision, I guess, is important. But I, at the same time, if you look at the works, there is there are plenty of imperfections, like cross. I have certain little rules that I end up kind of latching onto, I guess, um, in if I make a mistake in you know transcribing some of the text, I'll cross out. And so all of those things are kind of left in there <laughs> as, as um, kind of a, I guess, a refutation, is that right? Re refuting of um, perfection, mm -hmm. but also this idea that like, you know, I guess my own perfectionist um, impulses or, you know, uh, tendencies, I, I think, in my own, life, <laughs> you know, um, but I, I, so I kind of am interested in, in knowing that that's certainly never attainable and there's a certain, I guess, frustration, but also, you know, a, um, maybe something that makes me continue and continue and continue that down that same road to try to strive towards that, um, you know, and, and maybe my own inability to get past that, that those tend those sort of anxious tendencies <laughs> for perfectionism or whatever. Um, yeah, so, so that, and, and, and I think also like that, the repetition also is kind of related to that. I guess there, there's a term um, that I remember learning in art history class in college, you know, horror vacui, mm -hmm. um, and, and that was particularly in reference to like um, Greek geometric art um, sort of in this very fraught time after some major sort of societal uh, kind of degradation and the art that sort of emerged after that point was was um, very geometric and you know based on in uh, ceramics I guess and there was a lot of in, um, emphasis on repetition of just basic geometric forms and as an expression of sort of uh, societal anxiety right and worry and that feeling that kind of um, obsessive feeling of space as a means of I think like kind of have, having some order or control mm -hmm. or you know um, just feeling you know latching on for a sense of stability so I and I that's something that I feel like you know I, I, I easily uh, <laughs> can spiral into chaos in just my own regular daily life and so I kind of feel like all of these are an attempt to like Right. Impose, um, you know, structure and order in a very, you know, in a pretty rigid um, way, because I, I think I often feel such lack of that in my own, <laughs> in my own, you know, daily path through life. Can um, I say too? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> I think that's what artists are doing now. Yeah, yeah. We're, 
trying to find a way to respond to the chaos that's unfolding around us, and I think we are living in a moment when we need to respond, and, yeah. or we need to cope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I can see this as a coping mechanism. As much as, you know, the creative process is uh, uh, you throw yourself into it in order to make sense of the feelings that you have that are coming at yeah. you all the time. So just to say, I, I can totally relate to that. So I think, um, and, and here it is sort of seeking for, you know, that order. Yeah, and, yeah. But I quickly had to... Undo that. Like I said, I did a whole series of those, and I was like, okay, I'm a little locked into this grid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that piece came after, sort of as a reaction. But then I had the letters were flowing and the words were flowing, but I didn't feel the need to, you know, get them so orderly. But so I also it feel the process of working. Through. I feel like as I look at all of your images, or you know, the ones I think most of them are, if not all of them, I feel that. There is this sense of containment, or oh, yeah. um, you know, a, like almost a not. It almost has a sense of like an island, right? That's that's has a, has a um, enclosed oh, sort yeah. of feeling of, yes. and and in that way, I I identify it with like self preservation, yes. or just you know existence in sort of the dark soup. You know, of, of <laughs> chaos, kind of, and it, <laughs> that's, that's me just like imposing that. my own. No, I, I really stuck agree. on it, but yeah. that's I think that's what art is for, right? Like yes, it, you are supposed to be able to connect your own absolutely to leave to it, it that yeah. open. And I think that's what I appreciate about this language. We were talking about this with other people. How, what does it matter? It's an issue with my work as well. It's not instantly legible. Yeah, it's yeah. It, there's definitely this. It's, and it makes me very uncomfortable to see people struggling with it. And mm -hmm. I want to, okay, here's the translation. Here's what this says. You know, you don't have to work so hard. <laughs> I don't know if you ever felt like you needed to translate your microscript or if you just allow the viewer to, okay, pr we project our own meaning onto mm -hmm. it, and that's really fine. And so these stand as graphic statements. They don't need to be legible. Right, these obviously, right. they, they're functioning as really graphic. And I feel that way. I mean, I, you know, to me, I feel like the work, for the work and for me, what the text says is important and, and pretty important, right? It gives me an entrance into, um, you know, a feeling that, I'm experiencing while, you know, making forms and, and um, I guess, trying to figure out a system that seems appropriately connected in my head to, you know, content that might be in the text. Um, but yeah, at the same time, I totally, and I feel like I'm embedding it in the piece just right. for itself. Right. And, but that's, you know, that's separate, I think, from you know, other people, other people who, what is it actually? who may be viewing it, and right? I think it can be fine if they, you know, if, people, if other people, if, if viewers, um, you know, do have access to the text and the content of it, but I certainly don't think it's a an, an right. necessity. But if someone was living with the piece, like me, right, right. I would, yeah. like, really yeah. want to know what it says, so yeah. I would be asking you to supply sure. it with the yeah. text, yeah. and yeah. then the problem yeah. solved. Yeah. But it, it should really work on both levels. Yeah, I think they, they really do. So yeah, language, um, I thought that was a really interesting way to sort of bring these two pretty disparate methods of working together, you know, yeah. through this idea of language. And, and it's also about um, encoding, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, your grids, and I love these little uh, little molecular shapes yeah. that it looks like some kind of underlying structure of things uh -huh. that you're sort of bringing out um, that I really appreciate. You know, it's as if there is this sort of crystalline order, that we just can't see it, that there is order, and we're trying to connect to something that makes sense to us, or that, that connects us back to the essence of nature, you know, which is really uh, a good feeling, you know, to feel there's our, you know, this rooted feeling when everything else is falling around us, um, that we can always turn to, to that to learn, to learn more about ourselves and the moment that we're living in. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for me, that's that's definitely the function of art, um, all kinds of art, you know, to connect us to the here and now. 
I also, I just on a side note, I guess, <laughs> like there's a certain, um, like a number of these, I have, I actually sort of have, from in my own relationship, I, I guess I, I kind of view them more as like spells. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, I can see that. Oh, yeah. in a very conscious way. Um, oh yeah, you know, just a, either yeah. again, yeah. I mean, and and pretty specific spells, I guess. <laughs> against, That's great. You know, certain um, things happening today that I'm not <laughs> happy with. So, you, know, like, you can embed all. You can imagine that <laughs> what those things are, but we don't have to talk about them. Yeah, no, it's it's in all of this work for sure. It's right? <laughs> definitely a response to. Uh, the craziness that we live in right now. Indeed. Um, I could say a couple things about the box, um, and I sort of put it there as a way for people to sort of investigate some of the themes that are unsaid, and yet they still are unsaid. It, I sort of composed it as a visual poem, you know, that takes attention and that you can look at and try to find some meaning. Um, but it really was a way for me to string together some of the, where I had been, you know, in past years, you know, the idea of transmission and the idea that we are sort of transmitters and that sort of become distilled in this, in the antenna shape uh, that usually appears in some of my pieces, but in, in this group I don't really have any transmitters. Uh, but so I, I put it here, I really wanted to have one in there. And then another thing I was playing with was the idea of using the QR code as another layer to how we, how we might encode and, and disencode our, our vision, right? So when you see a QR code, you're looking at something. You just don't know what it is because we can't read it. We're not machines. But, you know, a machine to a machine, that is an image of something. And so all we need to do is get our little machines and point it at it, and it will bring you to that next level of translation of the code that's bringing you to an actual image, a photograph, in this case, a photograph that I took. Um, and then I added sort of a verbal description of what the QR code is pointing to. So it's like, well, maybe you don't have a machine reader and you want to know what the symbol is trying to tell you, but you could always read the words and the words will sort of describe the visual thing to you. So it's just a way to sort of play with that idea of how, how we gain, how do we extract meaning from the things that we see? How do we disencode you know, the hidden meanings in, in things? And, it's not just in artwork, but like we're super saturated in our environment with vision, things that are trying to tell us something, usually try to sell us something, mm -hmm. and that we need to be discriminating viewers and sort of discriminate what we give our attention to and what's, what, what's worth it, what's worth going through all of that work to understand something if in the end it's only to bring profit to you know some corporation that has artfully caught your eye and gained your attention and you're looking and looking at these things and, and to what end and then so you could also equally dedicate yourself to trying to extract meaning from another kind of visual thing you know that hopefully isn't trying to sell you something or that can really bring you to new ways of seeing the world, you know, in a more, a more interesting way. So those, that's another kind of idea that, um, you know, very tangentially approaching <laughs> these ideas through visual statements, and that's, you know, that's the way it is. We're using a visual language to try to say very complicated things, um, but it takes the attention of the viewer to, to make it happen. And how, what do we give our attention to? It's so. That, an interesting question to throw out there for people. <laughs> um, there's a couple people here who've been to Ireland where I did some of this work. Um, Christy was uh, a fellow when I was there, and Christina was there. Um, Cindy, I mean. So anyway, does anyone have any questions? And we can... Yeah, I'm interested in your palettes, your respective palettes, because... 
Andrea, you're it's such a silvery, like light sort of effect, um, mm -hmm. monochromatic. And then Lisa, you've got like such an optimistic color. I mean, it gives it an like, optimistic feeling. I mean, to, to hang the show, it's very easy because you alternate. Yeah, and yeah. You know, no, I but, so I'm wondering about your color choice and, you know, what it, I mean, how it operates and what you're right. trying to. Right. Imagine yeah. how different it would be if, if there was different colors. Yeah, right? yeah. It just mm -hmm. be uh, so <laughs> different. But you, these are your colors that you're using. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's funny that you're so optimistic. <laughs> maybe that's also <laughs> like, I yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess I so. I typically, well, I don't know, in my past, I am not, I have not been, um, I have not been, I've had a, a difficult relationship with color, I think, um, in that it's, I think I have preferred, you know, things that are more maybe tonal or monochromatic or, or whatever, and it just not, you know, sort of grayed out or low chroma or, or whatever. And then I think more recently, I guess I just have gradually started, you know, to walk towards it a little bit more, or you know, the, dealing with things that are more sort of overtly chromatic. Um, and I, th yeah. So it, I mean, to me, I guess I think of it as being. Um, I I don't know. I think. Um, Obviously, I, well, in my mind, in, I guess it, it, it seems to me like the color, I guess I choose based on the type, you know, the feeling of the light that I hope to have the image exude, I guess. And if that's, I think that is probably the best answer. Um, and I, I do find myself, I think my natural palette is generally like yellow, red, I mean, and before that, black. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, yeah. So I'm sort of try, and and, and some, sometimes I will set like stupid challenge. Well, you know, it just just really like not 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 deep challenges, right? Of saying, okay, what if, you know? Let's make a blue image because of my own discomfort with or my own natural like you know, avoidance of, of blue or something like that. So it, it will end up kind of being, I'll set out a problem that is, is pretty just straight up formal in that sense. And, but then obviously I will, you know, I, it has to still connect to, you know, to other meanings, you know, within the, the work or that I hope, you know, to bring into the work. So, um, and if it doesn't stick, I, I actually do a lot of color studies, um, like a lot of <laughs> a lot of color studies before, um, well, like for these pieces before I arrive at kind of what those shape, you know, the the color groupings, I guess, mm -hmm. of the shapes or the unit shapes kind of within the images. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that ends up being kind of an endpoint. Um, and strangely, like things actually, I mean, well, I, you know, again, I work through a lot of that process pretty openly, you know, before uh, it makes its way onto the drawing. So I figured that, I, I figured at least the color part out, I guess, and that can make, that can certainly change along the way to some extent um, and does. But also there's, there's quite a bit of change that will happen in the arrangement of shapes, even though they, you would think, you know, they, they seem like everything's mapped out. You know, there, there's actually quite a bit of um, surprise. Well, within <laughs> this little confined space, a lot can happen. Yeah, right? it's yeah. Just like, like inside, you, you know, there's a lot of space there. To, right, you know, or you, you have know. ideas about what you think you want, you know, right. to happen within a certain pattern or certain like layering of several patterns and then you know when when it actually ends up you know happening and it's it, it becomes clear that it's not you know it's not functioning well then 
you know, you have to sort of figure out a different path, and that can open up really things that are much different than I would have originally intended. So, you know, you were, I mean, when I look at it personally, like, at first I get a, like a lip as a color. <laughs> yeah, and then you get depressed. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the, and you see the text, uh -huh. now the text is in there, and what does it say? Because you can't read it. So it's, there's something else going on. There's like a, mur it's like a murmur, since it's so minute. Oh, and then the, you know, the title is there, adding something. And then they're like, well, am I obligated to get a magnifying glass? And, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it sort of works, um, I guess, the color a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, like, I agree. It's sort of, there's a, then it becomes a mixed emotion that there's, well, like this seems very, like, it's very satisfying and it seems straightforward until you look at it further and you realize it's not so or it, straightforward. It's like extroversion and introversion, maybe, I guess. Like, that you have, you have something that seems like a public maybe. Face and private. Yeah, and I mean, I don't. I mean, it's just the yeah, yeah, observation no. from looking at them, you know, yeah. not knowing, you know, just as a viewer. Right, you know, right. The, the interesting effect that it has. Yeah. Like it's a subtle thing that it does. I think, I, I, I guess in some ways, like, I, I um, maybe part of that is just, you know, the I, one thing I enjoy about work in general, art in general, is just um, you have a certain, you know, there's certain meaning that an image, you know, kind of will will impose on you when you look at it from a distance, right, you have a certain relationship to that image. And then, but as you move closer and as your distance, your physical distance with it changes, then you have this whole other very different, oftentimes very different set of experiences, right, where you find, you know, you can sit with something for a long time and you can find things over time and on, on a very intimate, um, at an intimate distance that you wouldn't have any knowledge of from a, a further distance, I guess. Right, yeah, yeah, totally. I, I, that's a good analogy. I mean, so, yeah, so I think that uh, maybe that accounts for those differences, I guess. So, Andrea, your color seems to be connected to light. Is that from your locations? Yeah, yeah, definitely light. Um, well, and I used to be a landscape painter, painter. So um, I definitely spent a lot of time looking at light and, and trying to paint light, essentially. Um, but then being in these northerly places and often in the dark at a dark season, um, that was also superfluous, and I felt. Like, but the colors were dropping away from my work because number one, I, I was a little <coughs> overwhelmed by what I wanted to say about the place, and that, that the color and the landscape painting just wasn't relevant to anymore to what I was trying to get at, and I really needed to simplify. So, like one of the first things I did when I, when I struck off on this path was. Uh, to get rid of color, to go back to a really graphic language and try to make statements that were a little more pared down, a lot more pared down, and maybe in that way reach something a little deeper. Um, and, you know, depicting landscape became something that I was less and less interested in as I was trying to connect to a deeper sense of landscape, rather than the way it looked, but more about the way it felt. And I think the, these three slightly architectural pieces are really about how it felt to be near that structure, which was a basically a stone structure. Um, so without describing it and without, yeah, without describing it too much, just to sort of give a sense, and I, I love the fact that, that this idea of, of enclosure sort of um, communicated to you, because that was definitely a feeling of being sort of embraced and enclosed not only by the structure but by the color, by the atmosphere of this place. It was very um, palpable. Um, so when I left the place, I started working with my memories of the place and 
uh, I had a few photographs that I referred to, and eventually I was really focusing on the stones, um, and that was that last group there. But yeah, for me right now, color is on the back burner, um, and I'm really enjoying working with this. The language of printmaking, the using, um, creating the edges through stenciling, and using the techniques that I've sort of developed a little visual language using the very simple tools and materials um, that I have with me in my studio, which is also about traveling to places with an enormous kit of color was also impractical. So it pairs down to, okay, well, I'm just going to do sketches and writing and, and really be in a place without necessarily working, except doing a work that's about attention and attending to and listening to and filling up with those things and those become the materials that come out later. So I'm not the first person to discover this. When you're on, on a residency, you don't necessarily need to be painting. <laughs> it's really important for me to be out walking and, and being in the environment and bringing that back to Philadelphia, you know, where those things seem very far away. Um, but when you spend time in a place absorbing that influence, it, 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 you take that home with you. So, yeah, for now I'm working with the simple language and um, continuing uh, with uh, visual poetry, which is, I've always been interested in language and I've always made artist books, um, and you always find a way to, to get the words on the page, um, but I've been doing a, a lot of thinking about the presence of language in a piece and what that means for our the visual action and being visual versus being something that's legible and, and read. So that's like my current train of thought that's picking up from this series into another more language-based work. So that's where I'm going next. I think there's a tremendous visual understanding of intellect in both of your works. And, um, and the abstraction a verbiage used in that pattern making in Lisa's work is um, just the micro <laughs> script in itself and knowing that she hand does this and, and, and how perfect it is and her striving, listening to her sense of wanting to strive for perfection but being intellectually aware of uh, our environment, our lives, and the imperfections in them, and allowing for those small mistakes that we can't see anyway, <laughs> because everything else <laughs> looks so perfect. And I'm looking at the um, dissection of that rock, and it, it is so intelligent and beautifully Thank executed. You. So um, I think um, intimate and exciting to uh, have been uh, able to view. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Well, the artists will hang out for a while to answer questions, and then actually next door at 2 o'clock we have an opening.